thank Jay Wood. Come on. <laughs> All right. Hey guys. Hey. Hi. Hey Brent. <laughs> For those of you that are new, my name is Brent, um, and uh, we are still. I know it seems like forever. We are still giving Michael some much deserved time away to enjoy the beach. Um, on his birthday, actually, it's his birthday today. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. So he has tasked me uh, with talking about chapter three tonight. We're going to talk about identity. Uh, just by way of review, for anybody that's new, Exchange Life is a Christ centered process that delivers hope and support to anyone seeking a life free from the snares of sin, suffering, and pain. What that means in a nutshell is that we go after the lies that have crept their way into our thinking, into our heart thinking, and have shaped the way that we live our lives, okay? And that's what chapter three is gonna be talking about. Um, if you were here last week, I shared a bit of my story, quite, quite a bit of my story, actually, um, and kind of talked about how the idea of identity is a lens, a lens that we see through, right? Imagine a, a big old like optical lens uh, for a, camera or telescope or something and and everything you think everything you know about the world about yourself about God you're looking at it through that lens okay and we have initially we have the lens that God gave us right we see clearly um, but you know the world we've all you know walked around and like met people and stuff and, and you notice that it's not an entirely wonderful place all the time <laughs> And, and over time, we encounter things that we, we learn something. We conclude something about ourselves, about God, about other people, and our lens gets a little skewed. And again, and again, and again. And then we find ourselves doing things that we never set out to do, and we don't really know why we do them, right? And it has to do with this lens. It has to do with how we see ourselves. It has to do with our identity. And so this is really, I, I want to kind of to dig into this tonight because it really is the core for everything else. Um, if you're new, we have a workbook. I think we have some of them over there. They're 25 bucks if you need one. Um, but you can get paired up with a first responder. Basically, it's kind of like a sponsor. Um, if you would like, we kind of give you a little while to settle in. And then you basically go through this workbook. Um, and it's going to ask you a lot of different things. It's going to take you through... Uh, different chapters. Chapters talking about anxiety, fear, depression, bitterness, resentment, anger, uh, sexual brokenness, bondage, uh, uh, self-protection. It's going to go through a lot of things, but all of those chapters are going to harken back to chapter three because they all in some way are asking, what do you believe about yourself and what do you believe about God? Because those two things are absolutely inseparable. The way that you've learned to see the world over time has answered those two questions. And everything else in your life is flowing out of that. Okay? So we're going to kind of get to the core of that. Um, on the surface, you know, when we talk about identity, the ways we typically identify ourselves are pretty shallow, right? I mean, somebody comes up and says, who are you? What do we do? We had a little stump speech that we sort of trot out, right? Hi, my name is Brent. I'm 37. I'm a guy, obviously, I hope. Um, I'm single. I'm, uh, I am a um, art school major turned photographer, turned graphic designer, turned software engineer. And, um, oh, and then there's one that we don't identify, or at least we don't include it in our stump speech. That's our sin pattern. That's how we, that's how we identify inside. What do we do wrong? What's our weakness? Where do we fall apart? We identify ourselves by it. We just don't tell everybody about it. But these, the problem with identifying ourselves based on these things is that almost all of them can change. And pretty much none of them are eternal. They're not the things that God has said define us. And that's a problem. Because when we start saying something different than what Jesus says about us, well, well you guys know somebody's wrong, right? Like somebody has to be wrong. It's not a good probably not a good uh, sparring match when you put yourself up against Jesus on that one. Um, 
But these are really worldly ways of identifying ourselves. And so um, when a lot of times when we come to be a believer in Jesus, we, we skip over the part where we actually need our core identity transformed. And what that means is we, we need to change how we think about everything. We need to change the root ideas, okay? So let me give you some examples here. I can just tell you what the Bible says is true about you, okay? I can, I can list off a few of these. There are lots of them. The Bible says you're a child of God, right? For everyone who's a believer, you're a child of God. Uh, 1 John 3, dear friends, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, right? So the Bible has this idea that when we see Jesus, we're going to know ourselves, right? When we encounter Jesus, we actually know ourselves better. Paul describes it as looking into a mirror. There's no mirror. It's just Jesus. But when we look at Jesus, we see who we really are, too, right? So the, so the Bible says we're a child of God. Um, the Bible also says we can't be separated, right? You guys know these verses, right? You could probably quote it. For I am now convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, depth, depth there we go, uh, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? Romans 8. A lot of you, if you just flip your Bible open, it'll probably fall open in Romans 8 because we're there so much. Uh, right? We, you know, we know intellectually, we know these things. And then we go live our lives and prove that we don't really know them. Anybody, is that just me? No. <laughs> don't look at me like you don't know. <laughs> Sorry, the Holy Spirit's had me kind of fired up all day, so you guys are in the splash zone right here. Uh, <laughs> bring it. Please. <laughs> right? It, it says we're pleasing. It says we're pleasing to God, that he takes delight in us. Uh, 2 Corinthians, he says... For we are to God a pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. It's, it's actually hearkening back there to, to uh, tabernacle and, and temple language, right? It, was, it would talk about the sacrificial system. There's a certain kind of sacrifice that was called a pleasing aroma to God, right? We smell, our lives smell good to him. He's like, yeah, I like that. You guys ever walk across the parking lot and like the barbecue place sort of drifts and you're like, ooh, <laughs> brisket. Like I'm rearranging my whole day to figure out how to get to brisket. <laughs> I'm very food motivated. Sorry. <laughs> um, the Bible says you're entirely new. Second Corinthians, whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. A new way of living has come into existence. It says you're a masterwork, for, for we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us ahead of time. Like, I could list so many of these, and you carry around a Bible that has hundreds of statements about what's true about you but we don't believe them how do I know because if any of us believed these things for a split second if we really believed this stuff was true we would have joy shooting out of our eyeballs at all times mm -hmm. do you know yeah. like if we really believe we glimpsed for a second what God is inviting us into, the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us, it would blow our minds and it would transform us. And that's what identity is about. Why? What's, what's holding us back from the life that God's offering, okay? This is, this is one of those lessons, I probably taught the identity lesson more than I've taught any of the other lessons in the workbook. And it's the one that whenever I teach it, I feel like I'm learning it all over again. And, and <laughs> the Lord sort of orchestrates uh, my life in such a way that I have to relearn it each time I teach it. It's just kind of funny. I'm not even surprised, really. But it's funny how that works. Um, but, but it's a question of, like, what happened? Why didn't we take these in so deeply that they change us? Right? That's what we were promised. Right? We, so we've all, you guys have all sat in church, right? And somebody promised you a relationship with Jesus that would change your life. Has it? Some of us can say, yes, it has, whether it's complete or not. But for some of us feel like, man, I was promised something. What's it going to get here? And that's okay. If that's where you are, that's okay. Um, what we do when we get disappointed is we intellectualize it. We start to say, well, I know 
that I'm a new creation, except my heart hasn't heard about it, and I don't live that way. Or I know that he made all things new, except my life still feels pretty old, and I still act like old Brent. You guys don't want to be old Brent. <laughs> so we intellectualize. We, we decide to live in the world of ideas instead of the world of, of real, instead of the world of, of reality. And that's a problem. We become like the kid that loves Disneyland. Kid loves Disneyland, he reads everything about <coughs> Disneyland, he watches all the YouTube videos about Disneyland, and he can tell you everything about Disneyland. One problem, he's never been to Disneyland. Do we want that? Do we want a faith like that? To, to be able to tell you about how much God loves us? But deep in our heart of hearts, do like, it hasn't made it there? I don't want to be that. Um, Look, here's the deal. If the church here in the West, if the church in, in the, the Western side of the world really believed the stuff that the Bible says about Jesus, the stuff the Bible says about us and our identity, there would be no such thing as polite Christianity. It just wouldn't exist. This, this whole come into church and, you know, we sit down and we stand up when they tell us and we raise our hands when the song says raise your hands and we sit down and the pastor ends the sermon and we think, that was good, that was nice, where are we going for lunch? <laughs> That's not what Jesus paid for. It's just not. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the hand? Where, where's the hitch in the process for us to take that stuff in deep? And I'm going to say it this way. What are we afraid of? What are we afraid of finding out? If we were to take that stuff deep, if we were to take that into our core, what would we find out? What keeps us from embracing our core identity, and believing the things that the Bible says is true about us. Um, fear is really the short answer. We can't really talk about identity and not talk about fear, because most of us have built an identity based on fear, based on some version of, I'm not sure I'm good enough, and I'm not sure that God's going to provide. <laughs> or I'm not sure, like, like God says he's my... God says he's trustworthy and he's going to protect me, except he didn't that time, so I'm really not sure what I can trust him for. There's fear, and we're going to talk about there. The Bible actually has a couple different kinds of fear. So, there's two kinds. And the Bible identifies these in one verse, which is great. I love it when it like puts things together. Like, here, this is important. Um, but you basically have two kinds of fear. One's called the fear of punishment, and one's called the fear of the Lord. And there's this episode in Exodus, okay? You guys still with me? Exodus, the children of Israel come out of Egypt, right? A lot of crazy things happen. It's great. It's a good story. Um, you can watch Prince of Egypt if you just can't read it. Good, you know. Um, still a great movie, by the way. Um, but... God brings the children of Israel out into the wilderness, and he brings them to Mount Sinai. And his intention is to make a covenant with them. Um, and so he brings them up to the mountain, right? It's a big mountain, and, and he's really encountering them the way that they think uh, a God is supposed to be. They have this idea. They just came from Egypt. They, they believe certain things, and God is not above entering in the way that we think of him, but rarely will he let us continue to think of him that way, okay? He's not about entering the game, but he'll usually blow it up once he gets in there. And so he he comes in, he brings the, the he brings Israel. Now he and Moses have been having some conversations, and so Moses kind of kind of knows and kind of has a relationship at this point. But Israel really hasn't hasn't seen that much, right? They've seen the angel of the Lord, they've seen the the pillar, the pillar of cloud that you know kind of protected them on the way. They're getting to the mountain, and here's what happens. God comes down in a storm, like a fire storm volcano thing, okay? It's scary, right? If you made this movie, it would be great. Um, but but it's, they're, they're, I mean, imagine standing at the foot of a volcano, right? Like, that would not be an entirely comfortable experience. And in Exodus 20, he says, or the Bible says, now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, right? Because that's, I mean, this is dramatic. The, the people were afraid and trembled. 
Yeah, I would too. And they stood far off. And they said to Moses, too much. They said, you speak, you speak to us and we'll listen, which is not true, by the way. You speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Okay? So they're freaked out, right? They're standing in front of this mountain. You guys, you guys are with me, yeah? Okay? Standing in front of the mountain, big scary stuff going on here. God is speaking and it sounds like a trumpet. It sounds like a horn blast. And, and, and they're like, no, 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 This is too much. Like, we can't handle God. You talk to God. We'll listen to you. Seems reasonable. But Moses says something really interesting here in verse 20. Moses says, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Or that, yeah, that you may not sin. Did you catch that? It's weird. Don't fear, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you. What's going on here? Right? We're not supposed to fear, but we are supposed to fear him. That's why he came. Here's what's going on. So God is coming for a reason. He's not coming to freak him out. Right? God doesn't do that. He's not like that. He's a good father. He's a good father even when he looks like a weird firestorm cloud over a mountain volcano thing. Like, he's still a good father. So there's a reason that this is happening. And what he's doing for the, for the children of Israel is he's offering them something tangible, something they can understand, right? This is how they think about gods. Gods live up on top of the mountain where nobody goes. Gods are big and powerful. Gods are scary at times, and, and, and they should be respected. Well, here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to give them regard. He's trying to give them something that they can remember and internalize that tells them, hey, this relationship, because that's what he's trying to form. He's trying to form a covenant with this people. This is the first time in the Bible we see him make a covenant with a nation. He's made a couple with some different people, but he's making it with this nation. He's trying to give them something that they can kind of wrap their head around so that they value the relationship. They, they hold it in high regard. Why? So that they may not sin. Right? So it, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking about fear. Okay? So on the one side, we have the, uh, the fear of punishment, right? He's saying, don't fear. He's not going to kill you. He's not here for that. Right? They're all afraid. They're saying, Dude, don't, talk, don't let him talk to us because we're going to die. We're terrified for our lives. Why? Because they were so holy? No. Right? Read the story. These guys have been grumbling. They've been, you know, talking about <laughs> mutiny against Moses. They were grumbling before they left Egypt. I mean, these guys have not been happy the whole time. They know that. They know that. So they're afraid. They're afraid of this relationship with Yahweh. And so Moses is trying to intervene and say, okay, there's two ways we can go with this. There's two ways that you can live. You can either live under the fear of punishment, which is going to lead you to self-protect. You, you got to shut down, right? You guys know about self-protection, right? We, we, we take steps in order to make sure nobody gets too close. We take steps in order to make sure that nobody really sees what's going on, right? If you're afraid that there's another shoe that's going to drop at any minute, you have to protect yourself. And Moses is saying, no, 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 that's not, what, that's not what we want here. We don't want that. We actually want the fear of the Lord, which doesn't protect self. It protects connection. It protects relationship at the expense of self. You see the difference? Fear of protection always leads you to self-protect at the expense of relationship. You will burn your relationships yeah. to the ground yeah. if you're in a self-protective mode. But the fear of the Lord is, or the high regard for the Lord draws us into relationship. It's relational. Okay? And there's two different mindsets here. This is the idea of what we're being invited into with our identity. Are we going to be individualistic? I'm concerned about me, which is the orphan, right? Or are we going to be relational, which is the son? Think about it. Orphans are defined by their lack of belonging. They're individualistic. Everything's about them. It's their little world, right? It's what we encounter every day right out there. 
and been here. Sons are different. Sons have a core identity that is defined by the relationship, right? If you go read the Gospels and you watch how Jesus refers to God, every single time except one, he says, Abba, Daddy, Papa, Dad, Father. There's one time that he does not refer to God that way, and that is when he is on the cross, when he is taking all of our sin, all of our backwards thinking, all of our sense of orphanhood and displacement, he says something different. Right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Has he forsaken him on the cross? No! He feels that way. He didn't forsake him on the cross. Why? The Bible tells us. God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Right? Anybody who still thinks that God is punishing Jesus, right? We have we, sometimes the, uh, theologians talk about penal substitutionary theory of atonement, right? That God, the Father, is punishing Jesus for all the things that he really wants to punish us for. Well, that's got some problems. Because the Bible is really clear that God didn't kill Jesus, we did. I mean, the Gospels, they say it in no uncertain terms. We killed Jesus, okay? It says God is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And that's what we're being offered. That's the, that's the full measure of what, what Jesus paid for and what the Holy Spirit is inviting us into with our identity. Okay, uh, you can think of it as, <clears throat> Michael says this sometimes, it's actually, it comes from a guy named David Thompson. He says, Jesus wrote the check and the Holy Spirit is here to ensure that we cash it. Right? There's some inheritance for us. There's something, if you read Paul, Paul's really concerned about this idea of inheritance. And it's not that he doesn't think we're believers. He knows that he's talking to believers. He's concerned that we may never step into the inheritance because it's in our account, but we haven't withdrawn it. It's there. It's waiting for us. But if we never step into our identity, then we don't have the ID to go make a withdrawal. We're walking around with a fake ID. You don't get anything from the bank when you come in with a fake ID, I hope. <laughs> if you do, there's an exchange for you to make there. <laughs> but look, here's, here's this thing. There's this, there's this split happening between the fear of punishment, which is the old covenant. It's the law. It's the law of sin and death. The Bible tells us there's no life under the law of sin and death. Also, God didn't make that law for everybody. He made it for Israel. So I don't know why we've been trying to walk around applying it to our lives. That's a whole other thing. But we can live under the, the fear of punishment and self-protect, or we can live under the fear of the Lord and learn to protect connection. Even when it hurts, even when it requires us to get, uh, dare I say, very honest. Okay? Some of you have had experiences where you had to get very honest, painfully honest, maybe more than once. <laughs> And that's a good thing. So uh, if we compare this some more, um, when, when you repent, when you repent under, under the fear of punishment, uh, you're trying to get real sorry and like show other people that you're serious. Is that repentance? Is that, is that what the Bible? <laughs> repentance means change the way you think. Okay, literally the Greek word, metanoia. Change the way you think. It doesn't mean get real sorry. It doesn't mean turn around and go in the other direction like some of us were taught. It might very much result in that, but it means change the way you think at a core level. Is, is trying to show people something, trying to show you're serious, oh, I'm really getting clean this time, is that repentance? <clears throat> the problem is, as long as you're under the, the fear of punishment, Trying to repent is really just trying to get people off your case. Because you're still afraid of punishment. And a lot of us have come under godly uh, discipline at times that was really disguised, it was really punishment in disguise. People have not always have handled this well. We'll just say it that way. Real repentance is different. Real repentance means there's a fundamental shift in the way you think at your heart level such that you are transformed such that you alter 
And repentance is known by its fruit. Its fruit is transformation. If that's not, and, and look, I want to be real clear here because when I, I, was, I was reading, uh, there's a book called uh, Unpunishable by Danny Silk. This should actually be a required reading. Um, it is, don't let, don't let the size fool you. It's a small book, but it will mess with everything that you don't want to be messed with. But it talks about this. It talks about coming out from under the punishment paradigm, which is how a lot of us have thought in the church for a long time. And we go around, we do it to other people, right? We're so under this idea of, of self-punishment and like, you know, we keep a little bit of shame around because it's going to keep us in line. Yeah, right. Um, but we're so into it that we go and then we want to punish other people. Well, they should feel ashamed. Well, they should get fired for that. They should be in a wreck for driving like that. Really? We're the people that are supposed to know the God of the universe? And we want to punish anybody? It's like, are we forgiven or not? I mean, so repentance here, there's an idea here. Depending on which paradigm you're under, it might be repentance because you're just trying to get people off your back. And I'm sorry and I won't do it again, but you'll do it again because there wasn't a heart change. <laughs> Or repentance, that there's, there's such a, you get to the core of the issue, right? Some of us drink too much, and some of us, uh, you know, will smoke anything we can find, and, and some of us will look at anything we can find, and some of us are angry people, and some of us are, okay, I don't, I don't care what the issue is that brought you in here, because that's not your problem. That's the manifestation of the problem. That's what's happening. That's not what's wrong. If you come and say, gosh, I'm sorry for looking at porn, great. But that's not what's wrong. There's something deep down that you believed, and it probably happened a while ago, especially for some of us that really dug our heels in for a while. Um, I'll just speak for me. You guys heard my story last time. I dug my heels in for a while. And, and so the thing that, that's actually wrong, the core identity issue, is way back in the past, and it needs to be identified way back in the past. Ultimately, there's a... There's a way that participating in the punishment paradigm, and you know, uh, I'll let you guys read the book because it walks you through different places in the Bible where you would think that God is providing punishment, and it shows you exactly how He's not, because God's not in the business of punishment. But when we participate in that mindset, the, pun the fear of punishment, we actually end up feeling powerless. Even under what we think is repentance, we feel powerless. We feel like we don't have options. Like I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to square everything. I'm just trying to get them happy with me. I'm just trying to get back in the house. I'm just trying to get my family back. I'm just right. How powerless is that? Whereas the fear of the Lord is empowering. It empowers you to make choices that are going to reconcile. It empowers you to make choices that are going to restore relationship, whatever that needs to look like. It empowers you to think, how do I clean up my mess so that every single person that I've affected gets what they need in this? It changes how you think. So, John talks about this. Uh, John says, there is no fear. This is 1 John 4, by the way. There is no fear in love, but perfect love. I want you to, when you hear perfect in the Bible, I want you to think mature, fully mature, okay? This is not talking about never had a problem. This is talking about maturity. Okay, there is no fear in love, but perfect, mature love casts out fear. For, the, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been, again, perfected, matured in love. Now this is John talking, right? This is the guy who was laying against Jesus' chest while they were eating. I don't know how you lay back while you're eating. That's what you're doing. John's ahead of the game. He figured it out. Yeah, he, I don't know. He's, he's got it figured out. But this is literally the guy that's got his head on Jesus' chest. Like, he can hear the food, you know, like, passing through the, the God of the entire cosmos. You guys ever do this? Like, I do this with my dog where I just kind of, like, listen to his stomach sometimes. It's a like weird noise. Anyway, i got to think that, that John heard some interesting things. But this is the guy that's saying, hey, hey, there's no fear. If you're still afraid of being punished. Love hadn't finished with you yet, right? 
This is why we can't, this is why we can't just hear the identity lesson and say, oh yeah, I've heard that one. Next, I got that one. Identity good. I'm beloved. Awesome. <laughs> no. You haven't heard it. If that's how you feel about it, no. Because this is the one that you never get over. You keep figuring out that he's better than you thought he was and he loves you more than you ever thought he could. Over and over and over and over. If it never gets into your core, it just kind of skips off the surface. All right, so under this new covenant that we have, by the way, the new covenant that we're talking about is a covenant made by God with man, with mankind, except that Jesus was mankind in making this covenant. So it's God making it with God, who is also mankind. It's, it's sort of weird, but it works. Um, God made this covenant with himself, and he exclusively fulfilled it. There is no part of this covenant that needs fulfilling. Jesus finished it. It's done. Right? I mean, that's what we say we believe, right? Jesus forgives us of all of our sins. He died on the cross. He canceled the debt. Right? He forgave us of everything. We, we kind of have this connotation um, when we say forgiveness. <coughs> like what comes to your mind when you think forgiveness? What, what does that mean for you guys? Let go of. Release. Release. Let go of. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it, does it does it sort of have the emotional feel of like, I won't hold that against you, right? It just sort of means like, I'm gonna let you off the hook. Okay, that's not what the word means. The, the word is talking about the carrying. Forgiveness is, I'm gonna carry the debt. Think about if, if somebody has a, an actual debt that gets forgiven, right? There's an amount of money and somebody just forgives that debt, says you don't owe me that anymore. What are they doing? They are incurring the debt upon themselves. They're saying, I'll take the hit. It still cost that. It didn't stop costing that. But but the person who's forgiving the debt, they're taking the hit for it. And that's the idea of winning the battle. <coughs> Forgiveness is, I'll, I'll, I'll take, God is saying, I'll take the cost of what happened, the cost of what you did, the cost of what you believed, and how it affected all of these people. You don't even know how many people it affected, right? He's saying, I'll take that, and I'll carry it, and I'll take the hit. So you don't have to take the hit. That's what we're talking about when we say he forgave us of all of our sins. He's not forgiving you of little surface of the, the surface things. He's not forgiving you for drinking and looking at porn and getting <laughs> angry and you know grabbing at the people on the street or on the road. And he, he's not forgiving you for that. He's forgiving you for the thing down at the core that you believed, for the thing that you believed that led to all of the the shrapnel, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? This is about an identity level thing. So, why don't we take this stuff in? Because nobody, I mean, I read some of them, but anybody can read your Bible. These things are pretty plain. Why don't we take these in? Just just read the Gospels. Read Paul. <laughs> read, the other, uh, read the other epistles. Like, there's no, you don't need a scholar to explain to you the things that the Bible says about your identity. They're just there in plain English. Why don't we take them in? Well, we have to get honest about what we believe. Maybe you believe you're not really worthy of help deep down. Maybe you learned that somewhere. Maybe somewhere you learned that you were insignificant, even though you're significant to God. Maybe you don't really believe that Jesus wants that close relationship because you just haven't experienced yet. Maybe you don't really believe that you can be free from your past, even though he's saying you're totally free. It's an opportunity and an invitation for us to step into a new way of thinking. And in this system, the only response God has to sin is forgiveness. There is no punishment. There's consequence. That should be noted. There are consequences. You do something, there are consequences. And sometimes God will let you bear those consequences because that will actually lead you into the kind of repentance that you need. Sometimes you gotta clean up your mess. Yeah? Right? Now, I, I honestly believe that we don't get the full weight of any of what we <laughs> deserve. I think God mitigates those consequences. But look, if, if, if you break the law, there are legal consequences that nobody can take away, right? That's consequence. That's not punishment. 
That's not severing relationship. That's not getting back at, okay? You gotta separate these ideas. Because with God, there is only one response to sin, and that's forgiveness when there's repentance. Okay? You guys may not notice, when you read the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, have you ever noticed this? When they leave the garden, they never actually repent. <clears throat> they're not sorry. Maybe they're sorry, but the, the Bible doesn't tell us in the story. They don't actually repent. Cain goes and kills Abel, he never actually repents. Okay? So there is a difference in somebody who's ready to get honest. There's a difference in somebody who's ready to do the work of cleaning up their mess and, and really dig down deep. The Lord is ready to meet you there. <coughs> and, and here's the amazing thing. We want to, under self-protection, under, under the, the uh, fear of punishment, we want to minimize our weaknesses. We want to minimize how much you see, right? Maybe I'll get a little bit honest. Maybe I'll tell you I have this thing in my past, but I won't tell you that my past was yesterday, right? <laughs> Maybe I'll tell you that I looked at that thing, but I won't tell you what I looked at. Okay, I'll tell you what I looked at, but I won't tell you where I went. Okay, I'll tell you where I went, but I won't tell you what they said. Okay, I'll tell you what, and we start, do you guys do this? I, I used to, I can twist words like nobody's business. I can hedge, and, and I'm, it's still self-protection. We're still anticipating punishment when we do that, right? But see, here's the deal. Self-protection tells you minimize your weaknesses. The fear of the Lord says come clean with your weaknesses. Why? Because that's where you get mercy. Mm. That's where you meet Jesus. That's where he wants to rush in and actually tell you how much he loves you and how much he is not ashamed of you, and how much he absolutely wants to walk with you through reconciliation and restoration, right? Paul says, I celebrate my weakness. And he's not saying I'm going around doing stupid stuff. He's saying, I know where my blind spots are. I know where I'm broken, and I need the Lord the most. And those are the places where Jesus is really, really helpful. Because when we want to self-protect, right, what did Adam and Eve do? They ran. God said, where are you? Why? Because they're hiding, right? The fear of punishment is always going to get you to run away from relationship. The fear of the Lord says, when you have a mess, you run into relationship. You run into the one because you know there's no punishment for you. There's restoration. And there's reconciliation. There's love for you. So, tonight, you have an opportunity to make an exchange in your identity. And this isn't something you do lightly, but if the Holy Spirit's brought up something, and most likely it's something that you would otherwise like to hide, <laughs> ask yourself. I mean, there's a really easy entry point into this. What am I protecting? See what comes to mind. There may be something that you need to get really, really honest about, okay? But let me tell you, there is so much freedom on the far side of not having secrets anymore. Okay. I'm not talking about your ATM password or anything like that. <laughs> Some things are private. <laughs> but but look, if you're carrying around something and you think, oh my gosh, I hope they never find out about that, that needs to come out. That needs to come out of the light. Because the Bible says whatever comes into the light becomes light. It actually transforms into something that God can use, into something that can help other people. Right? You guys heard me tell my story last time. You think that's fun for me? You think getting that honest is fun? I mean, I get kind of a, I, I'm sort of an oversharer, so I get a little bit of a, you know, but no, no. But there's a power to it. When we say something is true, right? When something true gets spoken and you have like a tuning fork in your heart that goes, yeah, that's true. And your head's like, whoa, 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 I don't know. Okay, that's okay. <clears throat> that's because your spirit is saying, this is truth. And my intellect can have a seat. I encounter God. God's not, you're not going to encounter God in your intellect, right? Because rational reason, he can't be contained within your reason. But your spirit knows who he is. Your spirit knows the sound of his voice. So if there's something that you need to get out, you need to exchange, 
there's something deep in your core. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. It doesn't matter when you learned it. I can tell you this. <laughs> this is a place where you're not going to find punishment. You're going to find an invitation to come clean with whatever needs to be come, what you need to come clean about, and you're going to find love and safety and connection. And whatever the Lord is inviting you into, don't you want it? Don't you want that? Don't you want the full expression of being a believer and not just to go through the rest of your life doing the polite Christianity thing on Sunday morning? Don't you want to be transformed? That's what Jesus paid for. So, we'll wrap this up. Um, the way that we identify ourselves in the kingdom, in the kingdom of God, will always, 100% of the time, be by relationship. First and foremost, the relationship with the Father. Right? Just Sometimes it's even helpful to just say it. The Father loves me. The Spirit loves me. Jesus loves me. If you need another round, go again. Just, just keep saying it. Because at some point, it will make it there. It will make it into your heart. Get honest today about what you've been believing about yourself that Jesus never said. And let him transform you. Okay? So, in the groups, in the groups tonight, you're going to talk about, is there a place where you're still self-protecting? Is there something that you or don't really want to get out there? And you may not. The Holy Spirit may not bring up something for you, but if he did, you know it already. Um, and explore. Explore the idea of what are you afraid of? What do you think is going to happen? If you really got honest, if you really let people see you, if you really let somebody get close to you, what are you afraid of? What's going to happen? Okay? Let's do that. Let's pray before we go, because that deserves prayer before we get into it. Yeah? Father, we don't want empty words with you. We don't want to just say things and blow smoke and pretend. We want, I want, the full expression of what Jesus bought for me. I want the relationship. I want your voice. I want to know you. And I want to live, I want to move completely out of the fear of punishment and move into the fear of the Lord that protects relationship at all costs. And so I believe that's what you want too. I believe you are, have brought these people here to take the next step in their journey, whatever that looks like. I believe you are making the next step clear. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for what you're doing. And I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.